Hello and welcome to our seventh episode of The Writing Vikings. My name is Lizzie and this is Ven. And Hello. today we are going to talk to you about a book that we have both been reading that we've both gotten very excited about and is also a very topical, topicy book at the moment. All topicy, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, would you like to say which book it is? I've got the book with me, even though this is totally a podcast and most people are probably listening on Spotify, but I've got Tress of the Emerald Sea. You know, I actually thought about picking the book up and bringing it here also, but then I just was like, no, Ven's probably going to do it. Oh, you know me so <laughs> well. What the hell? Uh, yeah, I've got it. Yeah. <laughs> it's such a beautiful book. Um, both as in beautiful story and it just looks really pretty. Mm -hmm. uh, but yes, Tress of the Emerald Sea by Brandon Sanderson. That is what we're talking about today. Yeah, so as we mentioned in the previous episode, I picked up and managed to read the book in a space of a week and then literally just went to Ven and was like, you should read this. Please yeah. read it. And then we will talk about it. So now we're talking about it. Exactly. Um, I just... I've just written down three things I'd like to talk about, but I've not prepared any questions or no. Yeah, so let's just like. go with your, what is your first thing you want to talk about? Uh, well, technically that's for the, okay. I just want to talk about first impressions first. What are your first impressions or for, okay. So we should probably just say that this episode will be full of spoilers. So if you haven't read Tress and you intend to, read Tress you should probably stop listening if you have read Tress stick with us if you haven't read Tress but you're not intending to read Tress anyways and you just want to hear us fangirl about a really good fantasy book stick around anyways because it's fun um that yeah that was pro that's what I wanted to get out of the way <laughs> yeah I'm pretty good at forgetting about spoiler disclosures also, I don't really think this is going to be like a reviewy like kind no, of we're text. just gonna be fangirling we're just gonna be about <laughs> we're just going to give a praise yeah. and talk about how much we love it. Um, yeah. yeah, okay. I want to hear your first impressions. Um, good stuff, mostly. But you can, I mean, yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. So I, I really like the book in that I like that it is very lighthearted, but also has like a very like interwoven plot in it. Like the plotting is so precise all the way through. Like I actually want to go through and analyze this book because you clearly can see like all of like the main structural points like okay this is the transition to act two this is what the purpose of this character is and the fun thing is he also is very self-reflective in the text yeah because I love the way he's written narration in this because my next point yeah because it starts off as if it's in third person but then you find out that actually no there is an actual narrator who when the main character actually meets Hoyd, it's like yeah that's me no I don't want to talk about it and it's 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 so fun and I love Hoyd's voice is just so quirky and I love that he he is like sort of channeling Brandon Sanderson's own thoughts about the writing process and commenting like there's one point where they go you know normally protagonists in stories like they just rush headfirst into things and mess yeah. stuff up but Tress isn't gonna do that she's gonna sit down and think about it for a while first actually I was going to Hoyd was going to be my or the narration um or the narrative voice was going to be my next point but we we can just talk about Hoyd now because we could talk about Hoyd for an entire hour probably <laughs> Hoyd is I feel like he okay so so right it's it's written from like you said it starts out feeling like it's third person and then you find out that the third or the the narrator is actually a character in the book so it's actually written from first person but it's not about the narrator it's about tress right yeah and it's written retrospectively so the the narrator in the book whilst he's in the book he's actually under a curse and he's insane um and the book is written from a, a point in time where the curse has been lifted and he is commenting about himself being insane during so the book kind of two different characters in a way, because they've got different personalities. So he's very self-reflective. He reflects on himself being under this curse and being insane and being like, yeah, I don't want to talk about it. 
um, I was having a moment, you know, and and whatever. But the funny thing is that the book starts off before he's actually introduced in the story. And then he says, like, and then she approached the cabin boy. Yep, that's me if you haven't figured it out yet. And obviously you haven't figured it out because you haven't been introduced to the cabin boy yet. Um, but yeah, that it, it, it's so interesting. And he does, Hoyt reflects on the whole storytelling perspective or, or the whole storytelling, like the art of storytelling, wouldn't you say? Yeah. And also like self-help sometimes. Yeah, it, no, it's funny. <laughs> he's, he's really funny as a narrator. Uh, but also funny as a character. So I feel like the narrator is a non-cursed Hoyd and the character is the cursed Hoyd, right? Yeah, yeah. And the yeah. cursed Hoyd isn't as fun. He's just kind of like, he gets on my nerves <laughs> because he's cursed and just causing problems. But narrator Hoyd is really funny. Mm. Yeah, so like for those of you that don't know, I mean, I don't know the full extent of this because I haven't read, it's that much of Brandon Sanderson's other books but Hoyd is apparently a recurring character throughout the Cosmere so he guest stars in a lot of small a lot of other books but not doesn't go into very much detail and this is apparently the first book where you've seen him kind of the whole way through when he's actually played a significant role um I, yeah I was actually going to say that as my first impression the fact that I really like that this is a standalone um we should probably should we yeah so it takes place in the Cosmere universe by Brandon Sanderson which is the same universe as Miss Bourne am I right yes yeah. but it's on a different planet and it's a standalone it's got nothing to do with Miss Bourne as such yeah so, it has yeah. references to other parts of the Cosmere but uh as somebody who has there weren't that many references to Miss Bourne and or at least not the books I've read and as somebody who hasn't read the rest like okay if you've read the others then you get the references but if you haven't read the others then you don't miss anything either you literally this could be your gateway book to Brandon Sanderson like and and I think that's quite refreshing because I mean we were talking about vast universes last episode and how there's just so much you want to read within different universes and so on um but it's actually quite refreshing that like fantasy standalones are becoming more and more common and it's quite satisfying to get this neat little package uh of uh of fantasy like a complete story arc within you know the front cover and the back cover without having to read on or needing to have this background knowledge it's just a really satisfying story on its own and I really like that yeah and it kind of highlights a lot of his strong points like you can tell that this is a very experienced writer who knows what he's doing he is good and it's also having fun. Like, it's very rare that you read a book and you can actually hear the author laughing as they're writing it. Yeah, it yeah. like, I feel like he had fun the whole time he was writing this. There were probably moments where he was scratching his head, but... <laughs> but he wrote this as a sort of little um, side project just for his wife, didn't he? This is, this is if we haven't made that clear, we haven't made that clear, but uh, this is his Kickstarter project. One of them. Well, yes, but this was yeah. this was the original. It's the, one? It's the first one. So the Kickstarter is four books, I think, and this is the first of them that has been released. Um, but so this was not actually written under any sort of time constraints or any, you know, like um, uh, I don't know how much the publisher was involved, but it was basically something he didn't actually write for an audience to begin with. I think he wrote it. No, he wrote it for his wife, and then his wife's, and then his. He said to his wife, apparently, if you don't want me to share this with the world, then I won't. And she was like, "No, I want you to share this." Okay, Um, just cute. Yeah, and I'm glad that she did say that because it would be very sad if it was just cooped up on a shelf. (laughs) Yeah, but we would know it was sad because we wouldn't know what we were missing out on. True. Okay, oh, well. then I'm right. going to move on to another point that I think is really cool, um, that he shows off his finesse in magic systems really well in this. Um, yeah. Just the world building and the systems. So, like, when it started off, like, I like the way he goes into it and, like, the whole world is set on, like, there's several oceans in the world and they're moving around the oceans, but... The fact that the oceans aren't water, but they're sand, and it's based on, like, I can't remember what the term is called, but when, like, you move sand, vibrate sand really quickly, so it becomes, like, liquid. He calls it the seed in the books. It has an actual term. The the grains themselves are called spores. And the funny thing is that I know what this term is because 
I like this book so much that I took it to class and used it as an example of literature that can be used in English lessons. <laughs> but no, I just think it's such a brilliant it's like it's something that is so simple once you it appears really simple when you put it together but it requires to like come up with these i just for these ideas to actually occur to you that this can be a thing it's such a random thing like to be honest it's it's a really random idea but at the same time you're like why is it random like it makes sense it may, yeah it really does yeah and like i mean at the whole kind of physics of this world I did not understand like it, it obeys some weird physics rule but because like every, yeah, with every it's, ocean it's, has like a giant moon over it and the spores have like a funnel between the moon and the <laughs> which is fascinating uh, I'm not quite sure how I visualized it in my head but uh it was it, like raining sand from the moon yeah so basically so the oceans are made of sand and the sand grains or yeah. the grains of sand they're called spores and they're dry so the sea is dry but there's something with air like air bubbles air pockets or something underneath the, the bottom of the sea that makes the sand move like water or but there's the also things living down there because the dragon is researching the biological system or he was researching some kind of system under the sea but <laughs> but basically the sea is made of sand and it's dry so basically the, the sea is dry but what happens Lizzie when the grains come in contact with real water I'm going to let you do the world building breakdown I'm say one word boom <laughs> <laughs> I mean <laughs> it depends okay they explode technically but depending on, oh, we've, we, we haven't made that clear. How many, how many seas are there? 12, 13? I think there's 12. Uh, we didn't visit all of them. You only visit three in the book. And they only experiment with how many spores is it? It's the, the verdant, the rosite, the air one. So they're only five, I think, out of 12. So there's a lot that is left to your own imagination. Um, yeah. And they don't even say what these other seas are. Um, so like the first one that we start off in is called the Verdant Sea, which is the Emerald Sea, and it's green. And when these spores get wet, they explode into vines. So like plants will grow up. And so everybody is really, really scared of these spores because if they, if you happen to inhale them, well, you're mostly moisture, so they will explode within you. And there's a really brutal description in one of the early chapters of like what will actually happen if like doesn't it say like the roots will go into your brain and like it'll go down oh, your mouth and, like you will choke and I think he he weaves it in really well like he builds up the tension surrounding them really well because he introduces them as this really terrifying thing so that when Tress like our protagonist goes out into the world and has to like actually encounter them for the first time like you are a little bit scared with her because you're like you've been told these things explode <laughs> and like there's a scene where she, where the ship she is on gets sunk and she has to walk across the sea to another ship and like you can feel the tension because she has to walk really slowly because if she kicks up spores she it could hit like her sweat or if a drop of sweat flicks off her and you actually see this with somebody who runs past her and sweats on the spores and then it, it all explodes around him uh, yeah <laughs> um yeah but then there are other spores and they react in different ways um and i'm kind of like should we talk about it or leave it up to the to the readers to the yeah i don't think i don't think because like if it is somebody who's read the book they're going to know what the spores are so we probably don't need to explain them because it's not a review and if it's somebody who's not read the book then maybe it'll just leave them some empty space to persuade them to read the book. Yeah. No, but it's it's a really interesting piece of world building. Honestly, it's it's really really interesting and it's done very well because I would say, would you do? You, did you feel like there was a lot of info dumping? No, because I did. The whole first chapter is an info dump, but I it is so, so well through the narrat through the narrator. Mm -hmm. 
that it doesn't feel info dumpy, mm -hmm. but it is info. Like it, it, he is literally like, this is how this world works. It depends how you define info dumping, though, because like I define info dumping as actually it being that resistance to like you are being told a lengthy bit of information where it could be. Story doesn't start in the first chapter. The first chapter is just the world. If you reread the first chapter, nothing happens. And so technically the world isn't built in through the plot. It is just introducing the world. And it's really interesting because it works and it's just not, it doesn't feel info dumping at all. But I would still say he is world, it's all he's doing in the first chapter, he's world building. It's really clever. It's really clever. I love it. But okay, it's not info dumping. You don't have to agree with me. But also, also <laughs> like my my um golden trident, I golden trident. I don't know what I'm saying, but my my. I don't know what I'm trying. What I'm you, you just don't want to say a bad word about Brandon Sanders. No, I'm not trying to say that. I'm trying to say my my like hero book is the Wheel of Time, which is info dumping deluxe. Basically, <laughs> that's what I was trying to say. About the Wheel of Time. I like the Wheel of Time, but oh my god, what an info dump! Like, we—that is a whole different episode. That book needs discussing. But, but the, the good, the, the funny thing, just the last comment. But I, I do the one thing I do really like is that I, all like fans of the Wheel of Time are very aware of this so much that like it becomes a joke about Robert Jordan because it is his style. Um, I like, think actually. I, Tolkien is info dumping too. The He's first worth it like the Silmarillion is really hard to read. Um, but no, I was going to say like there's actually because we, this can go back into Brandon Sanderson. But I uh, listened to him doing a talk about ten years ago at the signing uh, a signing when he released Way of the Kings, and he gave a description like in his own words that yeah. So Robert Jordan will look at a glass of water on that well not his own words I don't remember all of them but it was something like he will see a glass of water on a table in a bar and he will describe what the ice is like and he will tell you where that ice cube has come <laughs> from <laughs> and how it got there and <laughs> but I mean, come on to, if you if Tolkien describes trees forever if you listen to the audiobook of I can't remember which book it is now but anyway no the second one the ends are described for over two hours. I kid you not, the chapter is long. So info dumping, yeah. maybe we can do a whole different episode on just info dumping, but it's a thing. Yeah. But Brandon Sanderson does do it really well. It, yeah. It's the world building in this book is he, phenomenal. He's very aware of his audience, um, which is very- That's the thing. I feel like he knows he's info dumping and he's making a thing out of it. Mm -hmm. And, and- and in that way, it just doesn't become info dumping. I don't know. I love it. I love it. Yeah. Um, so what characters did you like other than Hoyt? Do you have any comments? And why? I'm talking about Tress. Because Tress, I've been thinking about how to say this in the right way. But Tress is ordinary. She's so ordinary that she's not your ordinary uh, protagonist. And I feel like there's a not a trend. And if we're going to call this a trend, then I really like this trend. But in fantasy, because we're getting a lot of um, uh, women writing fantasy now, and we're getting a lot of female-led or, or, yeah, female-led fantasy books out there with a lot of really strong young women a lot of books are becoming about these these hard badass girls and women and I love reading those stories I mean they're great and they're books that should have existed for ages you know and, and I'm really happy that girls get to grow up reading about these amazing girls um but it's just really refreshing when there is a girl who literally is not the chosen one because Tress is anything but the chosen one. She really isn't. Um, and don't get me wrong, I love chosen one stories. My book is a chosen one story. So like, but that's not the thing. But the thing is, Tress is just, she only really wants one thing and she goes to get that one thing and she does everything in her power to get that one thing. And she is, she's failing and she's not 
she just becomes brilliant throughout. I, again, like I didn't know how to explain this. I, she's just, she's not special. She's not it's special. Just very, very logical. She's very logical. She's very pragmatic. Yeah. And, and, and that is almost, it would make a character boring, but it's what makes her charming. Mm. And then she finds what makes her special throughout. And that is just the fact that she just w- won't give up. She's just stubborn. Yeah, and just that she's genuinely a good person and really cares about people. She's just, she's not morally grey. She's not, she's a good girl. She's got, literally, she's got good girl syndrome. Hmm. And I love that. I love it. Yeah, it's like, it's so nice towards the end when, is it La- Lagart? Is he the name of the the canon master? Yes. Yeah, yes. when he is so like nervous when after the the actual captain yeah. has been lured away and he's so scared and he and because he thinks that she's gonna kill him or hurt him and then she's like, I didn't even kill the captain. Like, of course I'm not gonna kill you. She's just good. She's just she's just good, and there isn't there is no 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 morals are questioned or and there's no line that's being towed, and she's not she's not two-faced in any ways you know she's just like you know where you've got her um Mm. arguably obviously this is written by a man but I don't I don't think that's even like an issue if you know what I mean yeah and no and I like how he like sometimes forces her to accept roles that she herself doesn't feel morally comfortable with but he makes it clear like it's the other people that have decided to believe this about her yeah you're just gonna have to be captain like people want you to be captain or like yeah we're gonna we're gonna trust you because we believe you're secretly a spy and she's just there like i'm not a spy and they're like but that's exactly what what i would say (laughs) it's it's really 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 good she she's refreshing uh, that is not to say that I don't like other female characters in other books mm. uh with strong mm. like strong women but it was it was just very entertaining to read about Tress I loved her another thing I really like is how like accessible the m- kind of magic system is to everybody that anybody could do these things and the reason Tress manages to do stuff is because she is needed to it's necessary for her to confront her fear of the spores and that she's less afraid of them than everyone else and thinks about it um rather than it being like her, it's her herself that has a special power with these spores like anybody could do what she's doing but most people are just too afraid to try um it's, it's that i like, like it's it's not like uh, people have magical powers or abilities to be honest, it, it's the world that's magical, right? And it's, Brandon Sanderson is known for having really hard magic systems. Um, and the magic system is almost so hard that it just becomes science, right? Yeah. But the spores, they don't really, uh, yes, yes, they're not natural to like sand in our world, but they it just feels like that's how they work just like I don't know photosynthesis I'm not I'm I don't do science I don't do biology but it's just it doesn't feel um unnatural or or supernatural in any way um no I mean like I said they even have dra- dragons conducting research on it oh shit yeah there's a dragon <laughs> no, was he, about. he was only there for like a few minutes <laughs> You don't often, and I think he actually pointed this out. Boyd might have pointed this out in the story, but you don't get to see a lot of dragons in fantasy. There's a lot of talking about fantasy mm-hmm. dragons, but often these dragons are like these legendary old things or like stories they've died. I mean, just look at Game of Thrones. Like everyone talks about the dragons having been dead for however long. Yeah, then, but there are actual dragons in Game of Thrones. No, but at the time, it was like the only show that had dragons. Or you go to Wheel of Time, which has a person that is called the dragon, but no actual dragons. Yeah, and in Lord of the Rings, yeah. you've got one dragon in one book. I don't know, it's just, it's, when people are like, I like fantasy, I like magic and dragons, and it's like, how many dragons are there? Yeah, there? I think people like the aesthetic of dragons more than they actually occur like in because stories. It's bizarre, because they're huge lizards. Yeah. <laughs> Like, it's well, true. I think it's dragons. Mm. Not all dragons look like mm. huge lizards. No, but I, I do think it's genuinely, I think dragons are one of the hardest fantasy creatures to actually write into a story well. Because if you write them as just like 
animals as if they're part of the world which I have read in quite a few books like it I, I'm personally not interested in that because then they're just it's like you've got just big lizards walking around essentially um so you really need to have like a good idea with them to really make them click and work um and I think that is quite tricky to come up with so I, that's my theory as to why there aren't as many um but but I like that we got a dragon a funny yeah, exactly dragon. and apparently Sanderson has a thing where obviously because I've not read that much of the Cosmere I can't relate to this myself but I heard that um he quite often hints at dragons in books intentionally and mentions that they're there, but deliberately doesn't let the characters go to see them. So he deliberately stops them from seeing them. Um, but in this book, like he was finally like, okay, I'm actually going to take you to the dragon. Yeah, I love that. Mm -hmm. Dragons are good. It's just, I'm sorry, I'm just sat here like thinking about dragons now. I'm kind of like, just... so what, what did you think about the scene with the dragon? I do you know at the moment I'm just I I see the scene in front of me and I'm like what happened no I thought it was I thought it was really clever it did take me a moment when Tress is out down there so she's been taken as a prisoner to be bargained as in the captain wants to be cured and so she is going to offer Tress to the dragon so the dragon can cure her of this disease that I I think it's too much to go into right now. Mm. Um, but the dragon likes people who aren't afraid of spores because he's researching spores. And so she takes Tress. Tress because... is afraid of spores, but she does it anyways because she hasn't got a choice. But then she comes down there and the captain is like, I give you this person, right? And the dragon doesn't have a moment to respond before Tress goes, I give you this person and it's just like really random but she just like throws the captain off her game a yeah, little bit. so she turns she turns it on its tail so then they have to fight between each other to convince yeah. the dragon which of them is least afraid of spores and then in the end like um he he ends up being like She's really a piece of shit, but I have to take her because I believe you when you say that if I take you, you won't stay down here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> she is too stubborn. She really wants to go and finish her law mission. We have not spoken about what she's even doing on this. No, scene. I want to add a final thing about the dragon, which is why I think that scene was really well played because I actually figured out what was going to happen before they started like I figured out that Tress was going to turn this around because I was like I I, whilst they were on their way down I was like she's going to blame the captain because she's clearly not afraid of spores because she's already like cursed by them herself um I was like this is going to turn on her heads but even though I realized what was going to happen I still really enjoyed it um I, I think I was just too invested in the story and reading to have time to even reflect or predict anything I was I was just reading actually I did not make that uh, I did not realize and I love the little quip on the way up it was like yeah whenever somebody takes somebody hostage they should really think about gagging them first yeah <laughs> <laughs> what I really liked with the dragon as well is that uh the captain's original plan wouldn't have worked anyways because even if she would have been cured she would have only lasted however long and then she would have had to go back and then, like, she, the only way for her to stay alive and survive this this curse or this this illness, I guess, would be to stay down with the dragon anyway. So, in a way, Tress saved her. Yeah. For trading her in. So, it just full circle. It was neat. It was nice. I liked it. And I also like that, okay, if we go on to the quest, because he does something that I really like. So her goal is to rescue the person she's in love with from a sorceress. That is what she's trying to do. She is trying to travel through these seas to get to this sorceress and rescue the person who has been captured. Um, he is the most, he's on an, this sorceress that's keeping him captive is on an island in the most dangerous sea. What are they? The midnight? Midnight sea, yeah. Yeah, and um, what I really like is there's sometimes like she goes away from this main quest and is doing other things. So she gets on a ship 
And she realizes that there's a lot of problems on this ship and she has to make a decision to stay with the ship rather than trying to go somewhere where she thinks might be more of help with getting her towards Charlie, who is the person she is trying to rescue. Um, But she decides to remain with the ship. But so normally you say like if in terms of writing perspective, you would say like try to stay on your A story the whole time. Like if you pull towards a B story too much, you might feel like you're falling off track. But he reasons it really well because he because she manages to think through that, oh, by helping these people, I might be help making steps that will help me get somewhere later. Yeah, he's very aware. Yeah. Of um of how he's using side side quests in a way. Yeah. Um really clever. Mm-hmm. While we're on the topic of Charlie, should we talk about rats? Oh yeah. Did you figure it out? When did you fi- at all? I figured it out when so she decides to go over the midnight sea. She takes Huck Huck yeah. the rat. Yeah, who is a talking rat that she has found on a ship. She found on the first ship and that ship sunk and she had to run over the spores, like we mentioned before, and she ended up on the ship that she remains on for the rest yes. of the world. So Huck is like the best friend, char- a B character who becomes like the best friend character. Yes. And then she, and then Huck tries to tell her not to go to the sorceress. She's, he's like, it's super dangerous, don't. So he's trying to keep her from um, succeeding, um, even though they're good friends. And so she gets so annoyed with him eventually because because she thinks he's going behind her back, that she actually puts him in a cage because she cares so much about Charlie that nothing will stop her to go get Charlie. But then she finds out that he is one of the sorceresses, sorceresses, sor- sorceresses, sorceresses. Uh, <laughs> familiars. Uh, and so she then, does she go in a rowboat across the midnight? Yeah, with him. him. With him. And then... The sorceress, she has like these creatures that she controls in the Midnight Sea, and they're basically going to attack her. And she and and Huck just goes, "Wait, I've got a free pass." And I realized that as soon as they mentioned like familiars, like a way way back, I was like, "He he is somehow he's already been there. He knows the sorceress. He's it's not a coincidence that he was on this ship, right?" I did not make the final connection though which we'll get to. But then when she's when she's met the sorceress and the sorceress is like, okay, fine, you can have Charlie. You you did come here. The the whole uh, the the curse or whatever was that to to make they they made a bet or something that Tress would come and get him. And if Tress made it to the island, Charlie would be free or some something. something no, like it, it was if um she gets cursed. So she had to come to the island and get cursed. Yeah. Um, for him to be free but if she'd left with so she the no, source i'm not getting there yet yeah so okay. when she comes there she the, the sorceress is like here is charlie present him and charlie's like oh hi tress great let's go back to our to our island and i'm like that's not charlie and that's when i realized that puck was charlie mm-hmm. and then your solution of the curse comes in yeah yeah so, which I thought was, I actually, I, I find, I feel like I should have figured it out because it is yeah, something that is obvious. really obvious, but I did not figure it out. And I was like, oh yeah. And like, I've heard other people talking about it and they're like, oh, I figured it out straight away. Or they figured out part way through. And I was like, I didn't figure it out. <laughs> but, I definitely thought that Huck was related to the sorceress. I figured that, was- I could figure that out because like yeah. there was so much, like he couldn't talk about the island and there was so much being tossed around, but the, the Huck being Charlie thing, I did not. No, it, I only realized when we actually got to see the fake Charlie when I was like, that's not him. Like it's yeah. first of all, it's too easy if you would she would just be like, all right, have him. But also he just felt wrong. And I was like, Char and then and then he made that really neat comment being like, Tress had grown throughout this whole adventure, but Charlie had not. And so she was not the same person that was in love with Charlie and blah blah blah. But obviously Huck was on this journey with her and grew and changed with her. But she didn't even realize that. And so they'd changed together and became like, it was just like the whole life lesson part of the story, the whole yeah. character arc. 
coming to a it was just that was beautiful very obvious very sort of happily ever after very fairy tale like um yeah. too good to be true kind of thing but I wanted that I went into the story wanting that yeah it felt like it's the only way this kind of story could end because it is within that fairy tale frame yeah. and I really I, I I really like the way he am because like I was thinking although I didn't make the Huck Charlie connection I was thinking the whole way through I was like what is going to happen when she actually finds Charlie because she's going to be such a different person like they're going to have to break up yeah, but I then that's it. how it's fixed because he's also a different person he is now got a tail <laughs> um, yeah um, but it was how they sorted that out as well without her being cursed the fact that Hoyd became uncursed yeah and then he could he couldn't uncurse him but he could change the parameters of the curse exactly and so Charlie became a human a human and Tress um, remained uncursed um, and they could live happily ever after but a really little bit cheesy towards the end when it was like I love you Charlie and he was like I really love you Tress and I was like okay let's you've said you said I love you let's move on <laughs> it got a little bit lovey-dovey there for a moment mm-hmm. but it was sweet still I really like the the fairy tale aura of this yeah movie. I'd say that like my only criticism and this is still like a minor thing is probably the scene around the sorceress because I struggled to figure out what was going on and I think there was some reference to magic systems that are in another book because she uses the sorceress uses a different kind of magic but she also has like a laptop and security cameras yes she had screens that kind of what which is an aspect we I don't even know if we're gonna have time to talk about it but there's a deaf person and he has a writing pad to be able to communicate with people without using sign language and he's basically texting people over a board. And I thought it was kind of like a wooden board, a magical board. But then the sorceress had a camera through there. So I was like, oh, is it like an iPad? And then it all just became very sci-fi from nowhere. And I was like, all right. I'm not- yeah, I, I just kind of had to accept that I wasn't going to understand this. That- I just accepted and moved, moved on. I, I wasn't bothered. I was just kind of struck like, oh, all right, this took a turn. And then I just decided not to be bogged down about it and moved yeah. on. Yeah, it's- no, I like that part I could accept. It was just more like I struggled to visualize what was going on with like the fighting scene and the because Tress didn't actually play a str- I would have liked her to play a little bit of a stronger role in that actual final conflict than she did because it kind of, when Hoyd gets uncursed, it just becomes like a bit of a mini showdown between him and the sorceress. And- but maybe Hoyd is just, he's... I don't- He's cool, but I didn't understand what was happening because it wasn't <laughs> following the same rules that right. built up through the story. Um, but the but, ending no. almost felt like a little bit rushed, maybe. Mm. But I was also there for the journey. You exactly. Know? And once the journey is done, like okay, you might as well just get it over with. Yeah, but I, I, uh, I really liked it. I really liked it. I don't actually have. Yeah. My points were world building, Tress, Hoyd, first impressions. We also spoke about Charlie and rats. Um, did you have any other points you wanted to talk I about? I just thought of one fun question, Go not on. to put you on the spot, but what would you want there to be in another sea? Like what kind of spore would you want there to be? Oh God, that is, you're asking me a world building question. <laughs> oh... I feel really put on the spot. <laughs> I, you know, my first thought was one of those like, once you get one wet, then that explodes into like another three spores, and then those explode into more spores, and then you just got, but like the classic, like Harry Potter and the coin. But it's room. um. Oh my god. Either Brandon Sanderson has got all of this figured out, and he will let us know in other books, or he just won't let us know it, and he'll live with the knowledge and the that that knowledge will die with him or he'll take it to the grave or he just actually haven't figured it out and that's why he hasn't told us about it um what if there's a sea that is just like the spores exploded to like tiny brandon sanderson heads you have thought about an answer to <laughs> no this. i haven't i haven't i just had that <laughs> just came into my head <laughs> i can't think of anything I really, really can't think. I will think about this and come up with a response for the next episode. 
no. this is really hard it's fine like I I literally have no idea either because like you can think of the obvious thing which is like elemental related stuff so like fire or things but to actually have something that would be fun to play with random. this was really random which was fun like they 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 didn't um they made sense but they it, it did you know how you got like the elemental was like fire air okay one's fire one's air one's water one's earth whatever it wasn't like that it was like they all were so unique you couldn't put them all under an umbrella if you know what I mean what do you think would happen if one of them actually turned into water when they got wet I did think about that but I think that would eventually just get rid of the whole sea because it would just keep expanding I did think about that because then but if one gets wet then that makes it water, which would make the next one wet, and then then the, the, there just would not be a sea. Then it will be an actual sea in the yeah. end, uh, with like a wall of whatever is in the seas next to them. But that would make them wet, so all the other seas would seas would just all the other spores in the seas would just explode. So yeah, or, yeah like as I, I, I was thinking, you oh. know, how in the red see in the crimson sea how they just create like spikes so i think you would just get like a wall of vines eventually or a wall of stone a wall of the crystals or something that eventually no more water could get through that sounds more like a fact story of creation a creation story because it's not something that you would be able to use no because it would already be done yeah but it's a, it's interesting um why why is he not exploring that <laughs> that little tangent <laughs> um yeah I don't know sorry I'm gonna yeah. have to think oh it's no worries like it, it literally I was just like oh this could be a fun question if she has uh any spontaneous ideas uh no, no I only have random ideas like how great would it be if one of the seas turned into chocolate oh oh yeah those random ideas all right I'm trying to look at this around me and I'm like there's nothing interesting around me <laughs> um I, I, I'm sorry um, it's fine it's fine know. do you have any final thoughts about tress i probably do but they're not occurring to me right now this was a very muddled muddled episode i must say we're I all over the place a babble fest yes and i hope that people could make sense of any of this you know um, in that case, I wonder if you have the next bit of the next part of the story of uh, of Anawea. I do indeed. And uh, I'm going to say I'm not sure it's my best piece of prose ever. Um, I typed it up this morning and but I am giving you quite a few things to deal with and I will let you deal with that however you want. All right. Go on. Um, take notes. <laughs> then okay. here we go I'm ready now when one imagines a passageway built into a mountain the first image that springs to mind is likely a long dark cave lit perhaps by torches or lanterns of mage light this was certainly what Anuea had been expecting yet as she found herself sprawling backward against the cold hard floor she could not help but be overwhelmed by how impossibly bright everything was Twisting around, she discovered that she was at the top of a stairwell. A long staircase of shining white marble stretched down at least eight feet below her, and it would take three times her own height standing from where she was now to reach the ceiling. If one could call it a ceiling, that was. Above her flowed a glowing celestial river, more brilliant than the sun itself. It seared her eyes to look at it directly, and the light radiating from it bounced off the white walls in a way that made her need to squint to see anything at all. Further down the hall, twelve statues of the bluest lapis lazuli she had ever seen lined the walls. Her heart caught in her throat. Barely realising it, Anuea's hand twitched reflexively to the nape of her neck, to where a tiny gem the colour of the sky was embedded into her skin. Before she had time to think further, a blood-curdling screech like the sound of rusted wheels and a man choking on his own vomit seized from the night outside. Anuea did not want to look over her shoulder, but morbid curiosity dragged her eyes anyway. The willow dash had hauled its way back up the cliff face and was standing at the edge of the preface, see eyes seething with unnatural violet light. It was wounded, bones jutting out of its limbs at acute angles, yet somehow it still managed to move. 
a writhing mass of blood, flesh and sorcery creeping ever slowly toward her. Hatred rolled off it in waves, and Oea was no longer mere prey. She had wounded it, and now it wanted revenge. And Oea's eyes flicked nervously to the door. The massive structure had not finished opening fully and was still grinding open against the limestone at a painfully slow rate. Hoping to reverse the motion, Anuea shoved her shoulder against the edges, but it was no use. The body weight of a single girl could not overcome centuries of mage work. She did not know if the Willardash would be able to pass through into the hallway, but she certainly was not about to wait to find out. Okay, I thought we'd left the Willardash behind. <laughs> I love this. You know, I actually just want to sit down and like world build with you. Mm -hmm. uh, because this is just, I love when we try to um, take on whatever the last person left and adapt that or, or to incorporate that into the story and then also leave enough for the next person to have something to deal with, uh, which is actually a really fun way to work. I'm really enjoying <laughs> these little snippets. Um, all right, that's gonna well, okay. New location. Well, you can decide if the Willardash is still a problem or not. Maybe he can't get through the door. Maybe it um, can. Gonna get an arrow or a spear from outside of Anoya's field of vision to just like strike him down, and then she's gonna be like, All right, he's dealt with, let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> Lie there and rot and like, stop him. bringing him back. <laughs> I'm gonna keep bringing him back when you least expect it. God. oh my god all right let's um okay i'm gonna i mean i'm gonna uh make make an attempt to to follow up on that yeah. um do you have any recommendations this week i've been reading a few more books lately so i have some things i can some things are fair well actually most of the stuff i've been reading is fairly well known by now um, so I'm just going to go with the one that is more recent. I think it's more recent anyway, but the book I'm listening to at the moment is um, Babel by R.F. Quang, yeah. which uh, another mutual friend of ours is reading also. And it is really good. I'm really enjoying it. And like, I read The Poppy Wars and I liked them. Um, I'm but, listening to The Poppy Wars. Yeah. The first book. Yeah. yeah. But I feel like even though they're really good, it shows that she's still developing as a writer. And like the difference between her language and how she tells the story between Poppy Wars and Babel like Babel is so like well crafted and you can tell like she's an academic um because it's like the magic system like how she explains it and stuff like the it I, I like I'm not sure how it's written in the book but like in the audio like occasionally the it's it's a male voice that's narrating most of it but then occasionally a female voice jumps in and explains something so like so either some Chinese terminology or some historical context that will either be based on real historical context or fake historical context that is made to fit the world because it's kind of historical fiction fantasy yeah. um, and like she will just cut in and explain and it sounds kind of like there's a footnote or something there um, but it's interesting because it loops kind of like etymologies and it it really relates to some of the stuff that I'm researching at the moment because it talks about how like, oh, when you make a translation, then there's not really a stuck meaning and it varies based on, based on different perspectives and yeah, just lots of kind of fluid concepts which are very strong in kind of the humanities uh, within the academic world. And it's really fascinating, um, actually. I'm like, this must, I feel like this must have caused like such a headache trying to figure out how everything works. And I'm like, I don't envy that process, but what she's ended up with is something really, really interesting. Um, Everyone I know who's read it has recommended it. Yeah. It seems to be, people seem to be very, very impressed by this book. Um, so I'm going to have to go check that out actually and see what, what, what it's all about because it sounds very intriguing. Yeah. Do you have anything to recommend? Yes, very different from that. But I am actually recommending a whole series. Um, I'm recommending the, I've got the third and the fourth book here, the uh, Lunar Chronicles by Marissa Meyer. Mayer? Marissa Meyer. Um, it's a YA science fiction, I would say, but it's also fairy tale retelling. Um, and I read the first book, which is a Cinderella retelling, a while ago. 
like years ago and I bought the whole series and I never got around to 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 reading the rest and then I read the second book uh while I was in Prague earlier this year which is a Red Riding Hood a retelling and I was like oh my god it's it's actually really good why did I never finish this and um so now my goal this year was to finish reading series that I've started. So I picked up the third one, which is called Cress, uh, a Rapunzel fairy tale retelling. And all of these characters stick around. So multiple narrative uh, and and all these girls are um, helping each other out in this sort of revolution. And then the fourth one is based on uh, Snow White. And it's just... It's really interesting from a plot. She's she she's a she's very good at plotting. You can really tell when um uh the second act kind of starts or the call to action, but it's not jarring, it doesn't feel um formulaic, if that makes sense. But um I know the first book is actually used in um Save the Cat Writer novel as an as an example uh, or as a case study I suppose to how to plot and Jessica Brody who wrote Save the Cat writer novel um actually used Cinder as uh, a case study in a lecture that I that I listened to so um it's just worth checking these out from a plotting perspective they're they're really 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 good so I'm in the kind of science fiction rabbit hole and I'm I do tend to lean towards fantasy over science fiction but I'm also very much into the whole YA it's very easy to read I'm just blazing through these books so um I I recommend them that they're really um I'm 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 to the point where it's hard to sit down and write my own book because I'd rather be reading but I'd rather have that than have uh, a dissertation to write that stops you from writing your own book yeah, but Although I don't have that anymore. But anyway, yeah, well done, you. Well done, you. <laughs> um, I'm excited for you that that's out yeah. of the Yeah. But anyway, do you have any final comments? No, I'm just started rewatching Game of Thrones. Please help me. It's addictive. I don't know what to do. <laughs> I'm also in this insane Tolkien like rabbit hole. I just want to read everything there is about Tolkien. I don't know what's happening, but I want to reread Game of Thrones. Like I'm in this, I just said I was in a f- science fiction rabbit hole, but like <laughs> fantasy is like taking over my life right now. I am breathing, dreaming, like everything fantasy. And I just want, to, I want to dive into lore. I want to just, <sighs> I don't know. I'm like scrolling through just books online and it's, it's so distracting. It's so distracting. <laughs> Um, but that's why it doesn't sound like a bad problem though (laughs) why we have this podcast because this is what we do um talk Mm. about fantasy so yeah yeah, I'm I've been re-watching Doctor Who so that's a little bit more in the (laughs) sci-fi oh god that's a lot it's a lot I do want to watch more Game of Thrones tonight Mm. we're on season one you still haven't seen House of the Dragon though have you I know I know but here's the thing my sister wanted to watch another series and I was like you haven't watched Game of Thrones let me introduce you and then she was hooked she's even watched some episodes without me which is unfair but um yeah Ned Stark is and it's still probably up. good to start her on Game of Thrones with Game of Thrones and oh, House yeah. of the Dragon because the first episode of House of the Dragon is possibly the most traumatic out of all of the episodes for me personally I I really like how she's like is the really pretty blonde girl in this series and I was like yes and then she goes I really like the several <laughs> Oh, Khaleesi. Oh, you, oh yeah. Uh, Amelia Clark. And she's just like, is she going to be nice throughout? Because I really don't want to hate this person because I really, really like her. And I was like, we'll see. It depends <laughs> on what you count as her because a lot of people don't count the last season as actually as being her. canon. So... <laughs> also, Sean Bean is still in it. And like, the more I watch, like, just King's Landing and Arya being little and like, I'm just like really like Sean Bean <laughs> so now I'm like <laughs> looking for <laughs> Sean Bean memes and like trying looking at Boromir and it's just I, I I think it might be getting unhealthy I am yeah so um I and I, I don't know where my Game of Thrones books are because I want to reread them I desperately want to reread the Game of Thrones books I'm thinking about getting them on audio but I'm listening to the popular <laughs> okay we need to stop. I think we need yeah. to come to um we need to reach an end and Definitely. we just have another 
another episode at some other point where we just fangirl about fantasy <laughs> in general and talk about this uh, obsession. Yeah. Um, but yeah, should we call it? Should we call it? Wait, or should we come to an end? Yes. So we're going to say thank you for listening this time. And we look forward to having you listening next time. Yeah. Yeah. See you next time. Bye.